right in this video I'm going to cover the basic workflow when using CST Microwave Studio. I've been given this um, list of requirements uh, to simulate a substrate integrated waveguide or SIW structure. Um, I'm not going to run through all of these myself but I'm going to show you how to parameterize a model so that it's easy enough to run through them. Um, if you don't know what SIW is, if you know what a regular uh, metallic rectangular waveguide is, then SIW is conceptually similar. It is a um, RF substrate, of a circuit board, with copper cladding on the top and bottom, and sidewalls made of wires. These uh, have been shown to be able to support modes uh, very much analogous to rectangular metallic waveguides. If you don't know what I just spoke about, then CST is probably not the software for you, and I would recommend looking somewhere else. Now, um, when you start up CST, if you've used it before, you'll have a screen appearing like this with some pre previous projects on the right hand side and previous templates that you've uh, gone through on the left, but uh, for new users you won't have this, so I'm going to click on create project. It will um, give me the opportunity to work through a template and this just helps to choose the best settings for the project at hand. Uh, we're going to go here, MW plus RF plus optical, that's the one that we want to use. And SIW is most like uh, in the circuits and components. Basically you just choose what you've got, you know, what your, your project is and, and the, the topic that it most resembles. Now I know from past experience that we've got couplers and dividers uh, seems to work best the settings here. If you are uh, building some of these other uh, things naturally then that will be what we want to use. We want to use the time domain um, solver, though the frequency domain solver can also be used. Um, I'll go through that, through why that is in a, in a few minutes. Dimensions, these are pretty straightforward. One thing that I would recommend looking at is here uh, the dimensions of units of length rather in millimeters and frequency in gigahertz particularly because of the ranges that we're going to be, want to be working with millimeters and gigahertz are appropriate if you're doing something with much higher frequency or very much smaller then you may want to consider using um, micrometers or what have you conversely if you're doing a very large structure centimeters or meters may be more appropriate the frequency uh, range this can be adjusted later but for the time being I'm going to go with 56 to 83 gigahertz 56 to 83 gigahertz you can set up field monitors if you like this can also be done later so I'm not going to worry too much about that for the time being the last screen just gives you a little bit of summary it's got this little underscore one here because I've already got a template but I've used similar ones so I'm just going to leave that for the moment and click finish. Then CST generates a new project. This may take a moment. Okay, once it's done that, you have in the middle of the workspace, in my case, on the right hand side, a list of uh, some tabs, progress, messages, and parameter list. The reasons for these will become apparent in a moment. It, they, this may be arranged on the bottom if, you, if you're a new user. I think that's the default. I put it on the right hand side here just because it gives you a little bit more space to see a longer list of parameters. And I don't need all that much space for uh, the design. Now, to begin building your model, 3D model of what you want to, um, what you want to build, up here, in the first tab is modeling. Now, SIW is built into um, 
a RF circuit board, it is a good idea from the word get go, from the word go rather, to um, simulate your structures so that they can be manufactured. CST can simulate all sorts of weird and wonderful models, but if you can't actually build them, then your simulations will be for nothing. You'll be wasting your time. So this is something to bear in mind. Find out um, if you're planning on building any of these things, where uh, you would, where you would manufacture them, what the process requirements are, what the, the limitations are, and do that. So this little block that I've just clicked here is called brick that um, generates a sort of six-sided 3D figure, cube or a rectangle, analogous. And you can either, either pick points with your uh, mouse or you can press escape, which I'm going to do. And that brings up a little um, text box or a um, message box into which you can type things, which will help. Uh, in making our project a little bit more easy to maintain and modify afterwards. Now, the name of the first solid, I'm going to call it RF substrate. You don't need to use underscores, you can use spaces, it's just a habit that I've gotten myself into. Xmin and Xmax, these uh, similarly Y and Z, Min and Max, these show um, the range of your um, solid. It assumes that it is sort of perpendicular to the the axes. The axes are shown here. I generally like to use X and Y axis as the plane in which the board sits and Z uh, being perpendicular to that. So I'm going to go type this uh, minus substrate with the two, the two, Wyman two minus and Zedman minus okay so as I've typed there I've used some variable names uh, substrate width, substrate length and substrate height you could also call it thickness if you wanted to in fact, let me do that just to um, avoid confusion. And I'm going to name the component board. If I click on preview now, CST will bring up a new box telling me to enter values for these things. So I don't know what size the board is going to be. I can adjust this later on always. I'm just going to tell it that the substrate would be uh, 50 millimeters wide. and uh, say 70 millimeters long and say one millimeter thick I can go a little bit later and consult my list of, of sizes but for the moment I don't really need to now previewing that you will notice that there's like a little faint orange um, line on the left hand side here so if I click on the view window and I scroll up with the mouse wheel. Scrolling with the mouse wheel adjusts to zoom. Then that will show me a little wireframe of uh, what the, the board is going to look like. If I middle click, uh, then it allows me to pan. Control and click allows me to rotate the view. Click and drag rather. Control and shift also allows me to pan. Uh, alternatively, I can modify here in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, what I want to do, but I find it most easy, easy to use these shortcuts. I do not want to make the board a vacuum. I want to load a material from the library. Now again, this can be changed later. My instructions was to use R Rogers RT 6002 So let's look for this. Uh, CST incidentally has a vast list of. Um, Of um, materials that are available. The, here we go, Rogers RT6002. Uh, I specifically selected lossy. You can simulate an ideal loss free substrate, but I want to investigate the insertion loss um, 
for these substrates so I'm going to simulate a lossy one and it's, it's a good idea in general to do that so that you can get a um, good idea of what your, your physical hardware will perform like. Uh, it will show you that if the dielectric constant for this particular uh, material is 2.94 the loss tangent is 0 0.0012 the last tangent is 0 0.0012 and uh, yeah, electrical properties measured at 10 gigahertz. This is a rather industry standard thing. Okay, load. So, okay, and our um, substrate has been created. Step one is complete. Next step is to put metal on the top and the bottom. So, I'm going to put another brick, press escape again. And I'm going to put metal on the top first, so I'm going to call it the top metal. I'm going to make it cover the entire board. You can adjust this as well if you want to, but for the moment, one is substrate, two, substrate, two, and one is substrate, two, and for the Z, the bottom of the metal should coincide with the top of the board, so substrate thickness over 2. For the height, we associate thickness over 2 plus metal thickness. CST can solve um, mathematical expressions like this, uh, so it can be fairly um, powerful. The uh, one consideration that you may want to make, CST does have the option of a local coordinate system. You can see the buttons up here. Um, I don't particularly like to use it, but perhaps you might find that it's that it's easier. Of course, we don't want this to be Rogers. We don't want it to be a substrate. We want to know, load a new material, and we want to use copper. I'm down too far. Pure. Right, so that gives you some electrical properties of copper, electrical conductivity, the rho, and etc. Uh, etc. Et Load. If we preview this, it'll ask, ask us hang on, what have I done now? Substrate thickness. Should have entered this parameter already. Did I spell it incorrectly? Okay. Paste. Preview. Such a thickness. Doesn't make any sense. What's happened? Why has this broken? Okay, it doesn't seem to have broken. Strange little bug in TST there, it's just asked me for this substrate thickness twice. I'm not sure why it did that, but it seems to have recovered. Now, as you can see, as I have changed the um, value, so if I change the substrate thickness back to, say, 1.5, some variables have been modified. Press Home Edit for Metric Update or F7. So if I just hit the F7 key, then it reads through the parameter list again. And rebuilds the um, the model, so it makes it thicker as well.
which is one, one of the reasons why parameterizing your 3D models are always a good idea. And then you can use and then you can easily modify them uh, so that you can simulate various different values. Um, finally, putting another brick for the bottom copper. Right. We rotate, uh, if you press control and click and drag, then it is a bit finicky, you need to press somewhere on the model, and then it uses that as a pivot around which you can rotate, so if you get it wrong, sometimes you find yourself looking at something that you didn't expect to. Once you get used to it, it's not so bad. Right, so now we have a board with cladding a copper on either side. It is 50 millimeters long, I'm just going to exaggerate this a little bit and make this... 40, uh, it's 70 millimeters long and 40 millimeters wide. Seven. Okay, so it's very clear which is length and which is width dimension. Right. So the next component of SIW is the wire that, to make the sidewalls. Now the wires are going to be running along this way, along the length of the of the SIW. And in order to make those, you click this button over here, cylinder. Same procedure as last time except the box is slightly different. Now the name, I'm just going to give it a name via orientation means in which uh, axis the, pla uh, the plane with the axis, what would you call it? Anyway, which along which axis is the wire going to run? It's going to run along the z-axis which means it's going to go up and down. The outer radius, I'm going to call it via radius. The inner radius, I'm going to leave it zero. X center will be. Um, now you really need to do a little bit of thinking, a little bit of planning in this case. Uh, from experience, I know that you need to do something a little bit like this: substrate. Uh, so w okay, minus w with over two. Y center. So x center is where along the x axis. This um, y is going to be now at the moment minus s w with over two s w with is a new parameter that I have just made, um, and it's going to be somewhere arbitrarily along here. The y center I want to put it down here at the front. I want to make it minus substrate length over two plus three times y AP. Yes, just to keep it a little bit away from the edge of the board. Zedman minus sub straight thickness of two minus metal thickness. So this cylinder is going to go right from the bottom straight up to the top. The two plus metal thickness. Okay, I should point out at this point that your parameter names do need underscores. They have to be all one, one contiguous thing. You're not allowed to use spaces. The names of your components can have spaces if they want to, but not your parameters. Okay, segments. If you use zero, it tries to approximate a circle as close as possible. If you use some other number, three, four, five, or higher, it approximates a, a circle with a, a n-sided polygon, where n is the number that you put in here. Okay, so if I click preview, it's going to ask me for what the wire radius is. You will need to do this according to, to choose this number rather, according to the, the capabilities of your, um, uh, your factory that's going to manufacture the, the board according to the drill bit sizes that they have. It's also usually a good idea to simulate for a few different drill bit sizes uh, just to determine whether or not that has a big influence on your design. So I'm going to go ahead and say 0.2, that's a fairly typical value. It's a W width. Now, to work at, um, say for argument's sake, we want to work at this frequency, sort of 56 gigahertz. There are analytical equations that you can 
get a first order estimate or even actually a reasonably accurate estimate of the, the width of the SLW and they're related to the equations for, for the sizing of a dielectric filled waveguide. Now you can go and look those up if you like and I recommend you that you do for the purposes of this video though I'm just going to guess and I'm going to say perhaps that the, that the SLW is 10 millimeters wide. And we should see a little wire here uh, presented for our view. Now it's sort of disappearing away into the material underneath. Uh, so if we come up over here, okay, we won't let us do that until we're finished with this. Let's just click OK. Let's see, make a video uh, circle there. On the navigation tree, if I navigate to RF substrate and I click on it, then it's highlighted. It sort of makes the other shapes transparent. And it highlights this one. So for the purposes of building, to make everything a little bit easier to see, I'm going to hide the dielectric board. So you'll notice that it's hidden in a way. It's not. It's still there, and when it simulates, it will simulate properly, but it's just not visible. So now you see we've got two plates of metal with the metal um, cylinder connecting the two over the wire. Now, I usually leave it the inner radius as zero to make the CST simulator a solid um, uh, cylinder of, of copper. Because of the skin effect and other things, this doesn't really make a difference, even though the wires are usually just holes that have plated metal on the inside of them. So they would only have a very thin piece of metal and on the inside would actually be air. But for the purposes of simulation, that very seldom makes a difference. Now, it would be very tedious to have to go and place each of these wires by ourselves manually. Fortunately, CST has a transform of the command. So the first thing that I'm going to do is translate to mean, mean move it around in a direction. And I'm going to say copy and unite. What that does is instead of making, you know, a hundred little wires and each of them coming up in the, the list over here, it joins them all into one entity. Repetition factor, this can also be a mathematical expression. So I'm going to make this substrate length divided by wire spacing minus one just so that everything fits. The translation vector it will be in the y direction of via spacing. Now if I preview, it's going to ask me what the via spacing is. I'm going to define this in terms of the via radius. General SRW principles suggest that your wires should be spaced at four times the radius or twice the diameter. Um, to ensure um, a minimum amount of wires and also a minimum amount of losses. Okay. Preview. Okay, so you see there that it's made a length of wires all the way down, and oop, no, it looks as though one of them is still sort of jutting off the end of the board there. So I'm going to make this minus two. Preview. All right, that's fixed. Fly. Now what I want to do to make the other side of the um, SIW, the wires down the right hand side, is I'm going to say mirror. Copy unite, I'm going to leave. Repetition factor 1. Now mirror plane normal. Around what plane do I want to mirror it? I want to mirror it around the YZ plane. That means I'm going to use X plane normal. 1, 0, mirror plane normal. There. And the center can be the origin. That's fine. If I click preview, you'll see that it's, it's uh, that my guess was correct. That X, X plane is the one that I want sometimes to get it wrong but in that preview tool is useful that it just shows you what is going to happen before it actually happens okay so click OK there and now I have a section of SIW right so now I've got the 3D model now what? Um, I have the opportunity to parameterize things to change things a little bit and the model will adjust itself accordingly um, even the wire radius, for example, if I make it a 0.3 millimeter radius, then it 
press F F7, the size and the spacing, and even the number of wires will have adjusted themselves accordingly. Because this is an integer thing, sometimes the spacing between the, the board edge and the last wire is a little bit um, unsatisfying. So what I generally do is sort of shorten it by maybe a millimeter, 69, just to make things look a little bit even. If you have a, a more serious design, you want to be a little bit more rigorous than this, then, then you can. If your design is a little bit more serious and you want to be a bit more rigorous than this, then you can. But for most purposes, I find that this works just fine. Right, so to go about simulating this, um, the simulation tab at the top is where you will find the tool you want. The frequency range we've already chosen. The background we do want to choose, however. Now, material type we do not want PC, not on normal PC. PC stands for perfect electrical conductor. Normal means just a normal, normal air vacuum, whatever the case is, normal space. Click OK. Boundaries is another important thing. Now, the bottom, I'll look at that first. We want the bottom, in other words, Z min, to be an electric ball. What does that mean? Well, essentially, we want our bottom plane to be a ground plane. We want the, the, the tangential electric fields to go to zero. That's what it indicates the AET. Um, in the x direction, x min and x max, that's fine. On a, think about what would happen in a real situation. You wouldn't have really anything on either side of your PCB if you just be open. The top, however, you'd normally be open as well. Um, so that is Z max. What I normally do there, there is open add space. And then what CST does is it adds a little bit of space above your model according to your frequency. Because we're at 56 sort of gigahertz, the space is quite small. If we were at a lower frequency, say 500 megahertz or 1 gigahertz, you would see that it would make quite a bit of space above. In a waveguide, a uh, simulation like this, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, but when you incorporate your SRW with other structures on the board, uh, such as microstrip, for example, they would be interfered with if there was an electric wall, say, on top of the, the simulation, uh, on the top boundary of the simulation, rather. So, I, to keep it consistent, I think this is just better. And the Y-min and Y-max are going to keep electric walls because I'm going to put wave light ports there and see what happens there in a moment. Symmetry plane, it is nice to use the YZ plane as magnetic symmetry. What does that mean? Well, the magnetic fields on either side of the Y axis are going to be symmetrical. That means that it saves us a little bit of computer time because the software only needs to simulate one half of what it would otherwise, and for the other half it just copies what it simulated on the right. Now we click OK. I think that is it as far as the settings go. Then we need an input and an output port. Okay, so we do that by clicking the waveguide port. CST always guesses wrong. Perhaps it thinks that the default axes are the ones that I don't that I don't use. In any case, we want ports to be normal to the y-axis. I want to start out with point one, port one. And yeah, positive orientation. So it's coming coming um, from the minimum y and it's pointing towards the maximum y. I do not want it to be a full plane port. I want it to be, have three coordinates. And so the x min will be minus s w width number two, and y min will be x max rather will be plus s w width number two. Okay, you'll notice that in the preview window it has shrunk the port to the size of the SRW. That makes sense. Wyman, I want it to be minus substrate height over 2 and y max subs ah here we go I caught myself out minus substrate thickness over 2 and substrate thickness over 2. There we go. Okay so having a bit of a closer look we see that the waveguide port has inserted itself nicely over there. If you want, you can in, uh, make it a little bit wider to include the metal and the um, 
the length of the wires. I find that this doesn't make a terrible amount of difference, but you can experiment with it yourself and find out. Um, don't worry too much about the other um, stuff for the moment. What I am going to do though is add another mode. So there will be two modes here. I want to add another simulate because of this, and I'll come back to it in a moment. Okay, click apply. Um, then it will go automatically to port 2. And for some reason, CST is a little bit buggy that even though it had Y selected, it was pointing it in the direction of the way, no, no my negative. So you'll see that the negative port has appeared on the other side. If I flip the model around, it already has the right sizing because it's kept it from what we did in the first time. Or it has two modes, so we just click OK. Right, so I think that is it as far as our model goes. Now, what I'm going to do first is here click Setup Solver. Um, accuracy of minus 30 dB that has to do with the way that the time domain solver works, and we'll talk about that in a moment. What I want to do first is have it um, calculate port modes only. And I'm going to restart. In the meantime, I'm going to explain. So now, if we click over and look at the progress tab, the, um, it'll show you how far it's getting. Now, because of doing port modes only, it won't take that long. What happens in the, the transient solver, the time domain solver, is that it puts an input signal, and here under uh, 1D results, when we've actually done the simulation, you'll see it. Uh, in at the one end and then waits at both ends for, for the signals to come out. If your frequency range of the simulation is below the cutoff frequency of your SIW, then the um, the energy will just sort of bounce back and forth. The waveguide will cut it off. Uh, it won't propagate down the waveguide and it'll just bounce back and forth here in a sort of a resonant kind of structure. Which means that the time domain simulation will take a very, very long time. So you want to check that you are operating above the cutoff frequency before you start the setup of the resolver properly. Now to see what it's got here in the 2D, 3D results, port modes, port 1 or port 2 will be the same, E1. Now it will plot me a little bit of an electric field and that looks exactly like a TE10 mode. You'll notice here that the F cutoff is 8.7. So that means 8.7 gigahertz and my SW is far too wide if I wanted to go um, for 56 gigahertz. Similarly, E2 means the second mode. Now the second mode that will propagate because SW is reasonably symmetrical uh, unless you deliberately excite it um, will be a TE30 mode and its cutoff is at 26 gigahertz. Okay, how to rectify this? Well, let's make the um, board a little bit, or the SW rather, a little bit smaller. Go back to the parameter list. I'm going to make the wires a little bit smaller again. 0.15. Yes, okay, if you change the parameters, obviously the, the results are no longer valid, so you need to delete them. Then SW width, I'm going to change that to say a guess of 4 millimeters. Press F7 to update the structure and you'll notice that it's now very small. Okay, let's try again. As I said, if you'd used your um, analytical equations like good boy scouts, uh, then this wouldn't be too much of a problem. Okay, now we're getting a little bit closer, 21 gigahertz. Looks as though this SRW is going to be very, very narrow for these high frequencies. Um, so how do we get this? Two millimeters. Try again. Okay, now it's looking very narrow. Um, Okay, it's finished again. Port nodes, port one, E one, F cutoff forty three. Okay, so now we're in the sort of the right order of magnitude here. 
Um, generally, if you're working with that sort of thing, you want the, the cutoff mode to be sort of your minimum frequency of interest divided by 1.25 to give you enough headroom so that you don't have any of your signal that's lost. 56 divided by 4, uh, by 1.125 is 4.4.8, and we see that the cutoff frequency is 43.6. That's for many purposes close enough. The next mode has a cutoff of 128 gigahertz, and that is uh, well above the limit of 65 gigahertz that we that was imposed. Okay, so the, the process is iterative and you would go through it like this. So now we're certain that the um, cutoff is, is where we need it to be. Uh, we're not simulating over any cutoff modes. Um, frequency range again, make sure that that's fine. Back to setup solver. Actually, wait, hang on, before I do that. Once we've established that the, the, the second mode is not... Uh, going to interfere with us. I'm going to go back to the properties of the ports and reduce the number of modes to one. So it will only um, propagate the first mode, or rather, it will only simulate the first mode, and it'll save us some computing time. If you're doing just one run, then this doesn't make much of a difference. But if you're doing parametric sweeps or optimizations where you have lots of runs after each other, this can save you a lot of time in the long run. Okay, setup solver. We uncheck calculate port modes only, and we click start and it will start to mesh the, the model and then compute the, um, the cutoff. So what you need to, may like to do is click on mesh view and that will show you how it is discretizing the, the model for, for simulation. Now an interesting thing about the time domain simulator uh, or solver rather is that the first three mesh shells after the port need to be homogeneous. Now luckily because we're at such high frequencies, the mesh that it's generated has three first homogeneous cells. Although you may no notice that these are a little bit thinner than the ones over here. CST is a little bit clever in that way. Sometimes it can't do this by itself and you need to manually adjust the mesh properties. You do that by clicking on global properties and adjusting the number of mesh cells per wavelength. You may also just need to extend this a little bit or make one of these wires rectangular deliberately and push it up straight against the port um, just for the purposes of the solver. To That's just one of its eccentricities that it wants. The frequency domain does, solver doesn't require this, but it is a little bit slower in these sort of circumstances. Okay, so you'll notice that it may take a little while. It gives you a bit of an estimated countdown of how long that it may take. And if you're working on a laptop as I am, you may notice at this point that the fan starts blowing and it starts to get pretty hot. So it is working quite hard. If you fire up Task Manager and click on Performance, which may take a while, you'll notice that it's revising its, its estimates reasonably quickly, coming down. So won't really take 500 seconds usually with one exception though performance so you see the CPU usage graph is quite high and it's using a lot of memory as well uh, yeah it's using transient solver in 64 bit mode okay so transient analysis one of two uh, it does two because it does one from each port um, you can tell it to use S parameter symmetries, in which case it usually only does one. But if you want to be really accurate, then you, you uncheck this option. But one exception, in, in which case transient solver will struggle, and you will see huge numbers here, is if you are simulating over a cutoff frequency and the energy starts to bounce back and forward. What the transient solver does, and it's, it's useful at this point if you understand a little bit of computational EM, I found that even just the limited knowledge that I had, a little bit of reading that I did, helped me to understand what CST was doing. So the, um, the modes that are not passed, or so not propagated, generally bounce back and forward with inside the waveguide. The transient solver works by putting in a signal at the front, and listening and seeing how it comes out at the end and at the front again for any reflections. 
it does a numerical um, technique based on, on uh, Maxwell's equations and it waits for the uh, signal to die down past a certain threshold so that option that we had accuracy minus 30 dBs it waits until the signal in all the cells are, is 30 dB lower than what it was um, or that rather than the, the amount of energy that it put in the front in the beginning and with a cutoff if you simulate over cutoff then this stuff just bounces back and forward if you simulate over cutoff this the stuff just bounces back and forward and it never reaches that well it does eventually reach that minus 30 dBs but then your results are wildly wrong frequency domain solver uses a phaser based technique but it has to do many frequency samples so particularly if you're doing wideband um, applications and, and non-resonant kind of stuff it does take longer and it isn't better to use the transient solver uh, but uh, and if you want to uh, obviously verify the response of your waveguide structures over the, the cutoff region, you should use the frequency domain solver. But if you're doing um, parametric sweeps or optimizations, then I would suggest that you limit your frequency range to the, the modes that pass and do that. And then once you've uh, optimized your design, then you'll be done. Okay, so that appears to be finished. It hasn't taken too long. Um, so here under the 1D results folder, a, a number of things have um, shown up. And you'll see this is more or less what I explained. This is the signal that was input. And then this is the signal that it saw at the output 1 and at the output 2. And from these, it calculates S parameters. Now, this is more or less what we expected. S21 and S11 um, are the basically the transmission. S21 is what port 2 sees as a result of what was put in port 1 and port S12 is exactly the reverse. Uh, it is what port 1 sees as a result of what was put in at port 2. S11 is a measure of how much reflection there was and for a microwave structure this sort of minus 20 dB level is pretty good. Um, the insertion loss that we were asked to do insertion loss is found specifically in S21. This means that over this frequency range the insertion loss is a rough, roughly sort of between 1 dB and 1.6 dB. You'll have to determine whether or not this is suitable for yourself. In SIW this varies according to various things. Uh, for example the thickness of the copper, the, the height of the board and the, the dielectric constants uh, etc and the last tangents of the board according to um, relations that have been derived in the literature and I would suggest that you go and look these up uh, if you're planning on doing a comprehensive study um, I think that is all that is needed for now now right okay so the next thing that you will likely want to do is a parametric sweep if you want to run the same simulation over a number of different um, parameters, new sequence, new parameter, say you want to sweep SOW width, linear sweep, or logarithmic sweep, or arbitrary points. If you have specific points that you would like to do to use, for example, these um, these board heights, then substrate thickness arbitrary points and I'm going to just copy and paste these numbers 0.17 there's a semicolon 0.254 there's a semicolon 0.508 there's a semicolon Do the first five, six, this, this clump. Okay, right. So if I click the check button, yes, delete the results, then it will run through this sequence and show me what it looks like. 
There's an orange one, a bit thicker, a bit thicker, a bit thicker, a bit thicker, and a bit thicker. So this is just a, a sort of sanity check so that you can make sure visually that your model works. Because sometimes you'll find that these mathematical uh, expressions that you use to generate the structure don't always hold true for any arbitrary um, combination of parameters. And so just checking through this in the beginning is a good idea to make sure that you have your four results at the end. Obviously if you click start there, uh, then your parametric sweep will start. You will be able to examine the results. Now what I do suggest that you do, so is this, is that your S parameters will look like this. You have a list of them here and they will sort of all be plotted together. Particularly when your numbers become large, it can be difficult to work with. Now, if you click here in the post-processing tab, you have the option of, uh, you can export your S parameters as touchstone files, but instead of doing that manually, set up a template based post-processing and have it done automatically. So, here template group will be S parameters, touchstone export, Number of samples, 101 is usually enough. You can have it as finely accurate as you wanted. Reference impedance, 50 ohms. You can, if you like, remember that um, the waveguide impedance will not be necessarily 50 ohms. The one that's used here, oh, I suppose it's close enough to 50 ohms. But because this isn't a line impedance, the, the 50 ohm doesn't really apply as such. And so in this case, it just kind of really happened to be close to 50 ohms. Okay, so now that that's there, that will export a touchstone every time we run the simulation. And so what will happen there is bring up an explorer. Oh yes, of course. That, so first of all, what I'll need to do is save this project. Should have done this right in the beginning. I'm just to save it on my desktop and call it test1 dot cst what's that C name? CW Duroid 6.02.56 gigahertz. Give it a bit of a descriptive name so that you know what is what is going on. Save. Saving model. Okay. Let me run the simulation again. And if I bring up Windows Explorer desktop so there is my CST file and you'll notice that it's created a folder with the same name. In this folder there will be a result and in result once it's finished these are the, the, the format CST saves its own data in. The results will be saved, a new folder will be here called Touchstone and once it's finished shouldn't take too long, inside of that will be all the Touchstone files um, numbered from from one to however many runs you do and in each case with the same name will be a text file with the uh, parameter um, the parameters that we used in each of the runs uh, this is just helpful in identifying uh, when you have looked at your touch tone files and decided which one you like the best you can go and look at the equivalently named text file and find out what the dimensions were and then what I usually do is um, just go back to CST, apply those parameters again and run the simulation again but with higher accuracy so say instead of with 35, 30, with 35 with 40, 40 dB accuracy maybe or perhaps more mesh cells just to make sure that the, the result is um, as, as accurate as possible before sending it in uh, for manufacturing I think I have covered everything that I wanted to cover. That is the general idea, and uh, you get a basic idea of the of the workflow in CST of how to build a model, of how to simulate, uh, how to simulate it, and how to interpret and to understand the, um, the results that you get. Incidentally, if you look at the S parameters while the thing is still working, you'll see that it generates some results, but they're not terribly meaningful because the port signals aren't finished yet. You see, for example, that the output, the input signal is finished, the red one, but it hasn't finished analyzing the, the output yet. So it's best to put that away and not look at it until the end. 
So I want to wait until this finishes. Yeah, I'm showing the touchdown file. That's taking so long this time. Right, I think that's what I've got to do. Okay, so yeah, in order to answer this question, if you wanted to change the material, that's easy enough. You just simply add a new material and then drag and drop over to whatever it is that you want to change the material of. If you wanted to investigate a different substrate, for example. Um, the thicknesses, the parametric sweep I've covered, port modes I've covered, um, higher modes, cutoffs I've covered as well. Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay, you, will need, you will need to play around with CST to find some settings. With every, uh, with every model it's different. Um, I've, I've mostly worked with SSW at lower frequencies myself, 50, 60 hertz is a little bit high for me. And so, but, but quickly enough you'll find some settings which are comfortable for you. For example, at 56 gigahertz, a 40 millimeter or 70 millimeter long board is far too long. Um, and it, no real system will end up being that long. So, it's probably a bit overkill, I just wanted to demonstrate just for demonstration purposes. So if you work with a smaller board, say 10 millimeters uh, long, then you, your simulation time may go down. Also, it's not necessary to have all of this open space on the side of your SW. Make it a little bit smaller, and that will obviously reduce the computational load on the computer and make your simulation go a little bit faster. Naturally, don't cut too uh, cut too many shortcuts or corners because you want your simulation to be valid a reflection of what your physical product uh, will do, what its responses will be. Of course, there are many many CST features which I haven't discussed uh, in this video, um, but CST has very good. Um, documentation among the best that I've ever seen already in software. Okay, so here result touchdown files. The TXT shows what parameter was there. It only shows substrate thickness 0.5 is because that's the one that was varied. If you vary more than one parameter, which you can do, obviously it just uh, the um, amount of simulation that need to be done then increases exponentially with every parameter that you vary. In any case, the touchstone file looks like this. You can visualize it with uh, with MATLAB or um, any other um, numerical package that you like. AWR is, um, is an example. It also, in the comments, gives you a little bit of information about what's going on here. The units are in gigahertz. You are uh, viewing S parameters uh, in polar um, format and uh, your reference impedance was 50 ohms. So this first number is S11, S12, S21 and S1, uh, S22. Now this number is linear so it will be varying between 0 and 1. It is not in dBs. If you wanted to get dBs you need to take 20 log of this number. This number is in degrees. Uh, again, this number is um, linear, and this one in degrees. So it's magnitude, phase, magnitude, phase, etc., etc. Okay, thank you. I hope I hope this has been helpful.